Uh, hello and welcome to Queenie Chen, who was so nice to agree and sit down to have this interview with me. Queenie Chen was born in Hong Kong and migrated to Australia when she was six years old. She has a bachelor's degree in information systems and her first published work was a three volume mystery horror series called The Dreaming. And to date, it has been translated into multiple languages, including German, which I know because I accidentally ordered the German version of the manga and only found out about halfway through the first volume. Uh, but it does exist in German if any of our listeners or viewers want to read it in German. Uh, she has collaborated on several single volume graphic novels with best-selling author Dean Kuntz, as well as on uh, the novel Small Shen, a prequel to Kylie Chan's White Tiger, uh, followed by Fabled Kingdom, a three book fairy tale inspired fantasy adventure. And I believe you're currently still working on your series, Women Who Were Kings, right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Great. So uh, welcome to this interview. And why don't we start with the first question? Sure. Um, would you label your own writing specifically as Australian speculative fiction? Um, why yes, why not? And how is it different if it is from other speculative fiction in English? Well, I definitely think my work qualifies as um, Australian speculative fiction. I identify as Australian, Chinese Australian specifically. And I think that kind of gives me a unique viewpoint that is a bit different to that of other Australians and also people from other Angli Anglophone countries. Yeah, so that, I think that alone qualifies it as being Australian. I think um, living in a country that speaks English that is considered a smaller country like New Zealand, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, um, people do tend to um, forget <laughs> that, that, that you're from a particular place and that your voice and your ideas um, are very much subject to um, whichever place you come from and their particular, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> a bit of a thing coming down. Yeah, and um, how they're subject to a particular place's history and uh, cultural identity and the uh, socialized, I mean, so environment, you know, the way mm. people socialize, the values, things like that. I don't think these things are immediately apparent, but I think they exist for sure. And they, they do come out in um, any kind of um, creative writing or creative product. And of course, I'm a graphic novelist. I do comics. So that's that's definitely a point of difference. <laughs> great. That's a great answer. Um, so since you already mentioned your comics, your art style is inspired by Japanese manga styles. Mm -hmm. And that just makes me wonder, do you think there's, there's something transcultural about that? I mean, you obviously have to have several different cultures that you draw your inspiration from. So mm -hmm. what do you think? Um, I think be saying using the word transcultural might be a little problematic because um, it kind of suggests a certain foreignness to uh, Japanese manga, which it is, mm -hmm. I guess. But I think we need to remember that a, the father of Japanese manga, Tezuka Osamu, who created Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion, he was very much influenced by um, American kinds of uh, Disney art and also by Felix the Cat. If I remember correctly, I think Felix the Cat is German, actually. So that, that might be Possible. an interesting one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure, so I, don't correct me on that. But nobody really thinks of Japanese manga as transcultural, as Western, you know, transcultural artwork. Nobody really says that or, or mm. think of it that way. Maybe they should, but it's just not done. So really the question here is that if I draw in a manga art style, does my art um, become transcultural because I borrow my inspiration from Japan? Well, I think um, we have to look at Tezuka's situation is that um, it's not that long ago. And so, no, I don't think um, transcultural is necessarily mm. the right word to it because um, it does apply a degree of foreignness, which I think shouldn't uh, otherizing Japanese manga words opposed to um, if I borrowed from European, uh, people might not say the same thing. So I think there is a slight kind of a, to bust out an academic word, post-colonial attitude to this is that people assume that uh, if you borrow from Western culture or Western art, then it is good and natural, and that's perfectly normal. Uh, if people start borrowing from Eastern art, it's like, whoa, what's going on then? We need to write an essay on it. You know, so I think that <laughs> attitude is kind of problematic. So if you oh, ask I me, um, <laughs> uh, should I say that just because I draw in a manga style? And my work doesn't count as manga because I'm not Japanese, you know, mm. nor am I, nor do I identify as Japanese. And... Um, nor do I want to move to Japan, you know, I didn't identify as an Australian, I so think that counts so much. So I guess I would 
I mean, in some circumstances, I would say it's trans transcultural, depending on how you use that word. But um, mm -hmm. I think what makes it specifically Australian is the fact that I'm Australian and that my ideas and my point of view and, um, you know, the themes that I have are Australian and my sense of humour, I guess. And so um, even some of the things I draw sometimes, which is not necessarily Australian, but you can't really erase the fact that I am Australian, regardless of what it is, whatever it is that I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is, uh, that's how I see it, to be honest. Great, thank you. I, it's interesting that you brought up the the multiple, I, I guess, inspirations that go into the the style that that is inspired by by manga. And after all, manga just just means comics in Japanese. I've talked mm -hmm. about that with a couple of friends as well. So yeah. it's a yeah, it is foreignizing in a way to describe it as that. And I guess art is always taking inspiration from from different cultures, and that has always been the oh, way. Yeah. Like no, no one in Japan denies that Tezuka was greatly influenced by Western art. Mm -hmm. And I think this history is overlooked when people otherwise manga, you know, and I think it is uh, a sign of our times as well that people feel that way. And uh, I think what mm -hmm. I said about people thinking it's normal to be inspired by Western art and abnormal to be inspired by Eastern art says something mm -hmm. a lot about, it says a lot about our current culture. Yeah, you, you're right, especially because it's absolutely not reflecting reality. Um, I don't think people who actually, um, I personally have a bit of an academic interest in this question, so that's why I brought up post-colonialism. Yes. But I think a lot of people who draw in a manga style isn't remotely thinking of anything like that. They just like it. They think it's cool. They think it's cute. Um, the Japanese have cornered the market on drawing cute characters. <laughs> you know? If you want to look point. at cute, cool stuff, you know, cute girls, cute, cute guys, they've cornered the market on that. It's kind of almost scientific you know, mm -hmm. in, in the way that they draw and the style that they have. That's, um, of course, art is subjective, but there are certain things that appeal to certain people and some of the certain things that are more commercial and that people are willing to pay for and that's all there is to it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, I personally know that the I the, the manga art style appeals to me as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, my drawing has been inspired by it. Uh, but I also think that Western comics have drawn a lot from manga recently, recently especially absolutely. with the panels the younger because generation they used to be so so strict so very rectangular especially belgian comics and that that has stopped and thank god it did anyway mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you for that very nuanced answer um so you've already mentioned how uh, being from australia that often gets kind of pushed to the side if we talk mm -hmm. about books anglophone books uh, I know there are a couple of fantasy authors in particular that, that are Australian, but that aren't marketed as such. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Australian speculative fiction is often overlooked internationally. So I was wondering whether you have any recommendations or any favourites of yours. Um, well, I have a lot of friends who are Australian authors. I like all of their work. Um, I used to be a fan of, um, still is, I guess, a fan of Garth Nix. I uh, grew up reading his work, Isabel Carmody, stuff like that. But about the um, Australian speculative fiction being overlooked internationally, I think the um, issue with that is far larger than people realise. Um, for my graphic novel work, especially with Dean Koontz, I work with New York publishers, and I think the attitude of the people in publishing houses pay a great deal as a... a has a great deal of influence on why Australianness is not considered a marketable point when it comes to overseas publishers. Mm -hmm. Most of the Australian authors I know who succeed in the US tend to market themselves as I am Australian, but I base myself in Sydney slash New York. Now this might mean anything. It might mean that you spend 10 days in New York per year and then spend the rest of the time in Sydney. But the point is that they say what they say, just appear more American. And uh, the reason for that is that there is absolutely no benefit to you as an author or an artist working for New York publishers and not give, and in some way give the impression that you're also living in, the, in New York. It's got to do, it's got something to do with New York publishing culture and what I've found about, um, at least well, that's what I feel about New York publishing culture with what I've encountered of it, is that they are, New York is a, I mean, it's New York. It's, it's, it's a rather parochial place. It's a massive international city, but you can encounter a lot of New Yorkers who are like, I never need to move leave New York, you know, I got everything that I need here. It's just, for an international city, it has a strangely parochial culture, particularly for its um, cultural industries. Um, that includes book publishing, theater, that, that kind of stuff. 
Um, this is not an attitude I come across in other international cities. Like I'm from Hong Kong. That's pretty much the New York of the East. I like New. York, uh, I can tell you that honkers are not the least bit parochial. They love to travel and they think it's a big deal and they do it all the time. And same for other cities like London and um, Tokyo, Shanghai, those places, these people don't really feel that way. But anyway, what I feel about the New York publishing industry is that um, when I was working as an illustrator there, my editor kind of urged me, you've got to move to New York. Like, when are you moving to New York? And it's like, is that such a big deal? I'm sitting in Australia here. And um, I could do the work from over here. I don't actually need to be in New York. But here's the thing, you need to be seen in New York. You've got to do FaceTiming with all the publishing companies. And apparently if you don't do it, then you're kind of a non-person non in some kind of way. And it also doesn't help that um, in the Anglophone map of the world, if the Anglophone countries like the Canada, UK, um, the US, Australia, and New Zealand, if they were a map of the US, because let's face it, that's how Americans think anyway. If that was a map of the US, then Australia would be the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, that's how people see Australia in, in a place like New York, in America anyway. So if you're talking about how people see you, if you're from Australia and you're blatantly Australian and you decide to stay in Australia, then you're from the Midwest of the Midwest. And New York being a cultural capital, they do tend to look down a little bit on that sort of thing. So that's why there's no benefit to marketing yourself as an Australian. It is considered, uh, you know, a little bit, hmm, you know, yeah. what they say about flyover country. <laughs> a little bit boring, you know, not Sorry. sexy. <laughs> not leading any cultural charges, you know, not being on the cutting edge. Now, I think this is totally untrue, but this Absolutely. country does have an image problem you know, when it comes to stuff like that. Okay, I think Australians are very cutting edge. Um, when companies need to test new um, tech stuff uh, like Pokemon Go, there's a reason why they tested in Australia first. There's a reason why when they, a while ago, they did the Game of Thrones exhibition in Australia. This is a test, like this country is a testing ground for a lot of new tech because Australians tend to be open-minded and they pick up new tech quickly. Mm -hmm. That does not sound like a backward country, right? But that's what people, that's what marketing people who do tech know. Well, what publishing people, you know, in New York, in cultural yes. industries know is a different thing altogether. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess it's a, it's a specific of being in a New York publishing house. Um, I've got mm -hmm. other stories by other um, Australian authors, but I don't want to go into that because these are other people's stories. But that's my right. impression of of how the, the image of Australia, at least within the cultural industries in a place like New York, kind of limits one from advertising oneself as an Australian. Mm. That's that's interesting. That that might go towards explaining a lot of these very high profile Australian fantasy writers not not being very well, I did known for being Australian. Australian. Mm. Oh yeah. That happens <laughs> a lot. Is it happens a lot in graphic novels as well. Like a lot of like pretty much all the Aussie authors that I know who work for um, DC and Marvel, not a lot of them, let's, let's face it, the company's in a little bit of trouble right now, both DC and Marvel, but uh, they don't advertise their Australianness because mm. what is the point? Like nobody cares, man. <laughs> it is not a point of interest. Whereas wow. um, you look at British authors like Neil Gaiman and um, Alan Moore, they're both Brits. They've had a huge influence on the yes. American um, comics industry and they wear that, their Britishness, even though they live in America probably, they wear their Britishness on their sleeves. There is a certain cachet attached to being a British writer in comics mm. that you won't find, you know, for writers in Australian comics. So I guess it's different for Canadians and New Zealanders as well. But that's mm. a fact, and I feel that needs to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we might change that a little bit by making <laughs> Australian speculative fiction more known more popular mm -hmm. because it is a great field there's there's so much there i mm -hmm. i continue to be fascinated by it mm -hmm. um well, we already talked about drawing inspiration from other mm -hmm. writings so that mm -hmm. brings me to my next question which works of fiction have inspired you and uh, which other artists inspire you which mangas have you have have influenced your art the most uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, uh, I read a lot of manga. I have my favorites. Um, probably, if you're talking about what I like, it's not necessarily the kind of stuff that inspires me to pick up a pencil and, pencil and draw. That would be a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the manga artists that inspired me, I would say uh, this creator of One Piece, Eiichiro Oda, like uh, he, incredible imagination. Um, very crazy and out there, but that's 
you know, a positive. Um, there's also um, Rumiko Takahashi, who did uh, who did a lot of stuff. Rama Half is one of uh, her more famous works, but I grew up reading her. So because this was in the 80s, I think she all she had a very open minded towards women, uh, open minded attitude towards women. And I didn't know she was a woman too much later on. But looking back at her work, it was like it's like her female characters were always so fantastic. Um, they were they had a lot of uh, sex appeal because she was drawing my, primarily for a male audience. But um, mm -hmm. loved about, loved the way that she wrote her female characters. Very they're an interesting bunch with strong personalities and all that. So I guess as a kid, uh, without much access to female role models, uh, she was a great inspiration. Um, there's also um, Togashi um, who created Hunter Hunter. I think he was a massive influence on some of the newer. A manga that's coming out and that's gaining popularity. So um, apart from Dragon Ball, who is um, Kira Toriyama, and I grew up reading Dragon Ball, I have appreciation for it, it's very macho, but you know, he started a massive trend there. So, um, but I think when it comes to the more cerebral um, sort of stuff, and when it comes to writing characters, um, Togashi's Hunter Hunter is a much bigger influence on more modern day um, young a manga by younger artists. So um, big hats off to him. I really, really love his work. And, um, the guy does only puts out work very sporadically now, but uh, people forgive him for that because he's such a great writer and so influential. Yep. So in terms of um, other kind of um, influences, I game a lot. So I do get a lot of ideas from video gaming and I don't really play mainstream games anymore. Um, I grew up video gaming. So, you know, always been a Nintendo fan girl, but um, the, the growth in indie games has been a massive, massive boon to video gaming. And uh, it's incredible to see all these different art styles and all these different visions when it comes to um, the indie game department. So um, I mostly play indie games these days because the artwork is so varied and some are, sometimes the stories are so interesting and some people's personal visions are so plain weird and just worth checking out for that reason. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I find a lot of inspiration from indie video games these days. Cool. Uh, what's the, the last few indie games that you've played? Um, this is one called... Um, well, Stardew Valley is pretty well known. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a farming sim game. And so somebody made a creepy version of Stardew Valley, <laughs> which is a graveyard <laughs> keeper. Now, this game has a lot of flaws. I think it, um, it's not particularly well designed, but the, the, the sense of humor in it is very irreverent. And I appreciate it because um, this game has you just teleport to a medieval graveyard when you become the gravekeeper. And the first thing you do is to hack up a human body and try and sell the meat to the local bartender. <laughs> uh, like sad. that's the first thing you do and it's like okay so this game has a very twisted sense of humor and I found it a great a great um interesting contrast to Stardew Valley which is mostly wholesome you know <laughs> this game is like out of the out of the gate it's like it's the morally bankrupt version of Stardew Valley and I love that because um in a more traditional a game development um, or in a more mainstream game development environment, you wouldn't be able to do something like that. You know, <laughs> making jokes about can like grave robbing and cannibalism is not fun. You know, it's not accept socially acceptable. But yes. uh, people do that kind of stuff in indie gaming. And that's what, that's what I appreciate. It's funny and it's out there and you remember it. You know, so I think that goes a long way in uh, mm -hmm. yeah, making something memorable. Yeah, that, that does sound very memorable, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so I think this, this goes in a kind of a different direction now, but uh, what's your process when coming up with a new story uh, for a comic? And do you start with the images or the narrative? Because I'm a writer, so I tend to start with the narrative first, but there are times where I would be inspired by an image and that happens quite a lot. Um, I try and adapt my art style to fit the story and uh, so for me, art is a very fluid thing. So primarily I see myself as a storyteller first, but I always think that um, regardless of how awesome the sparkling image is for whatever it is that you know inspired you to even do the story in the first place, without a good story, there's really not much point. I'm not really the kind for exper experimental comics either. Like I, I like appreciate them, but I don't really create them myself. So um, the idea of doing something that is more like a non sequitur kind of, um, a collage of images just like uh, it's not me it's not that kind of person to be honest <laughs> yeah but um I do think that um there is something to be said by being inspired by, just, by an image because mm -hmm. I some of the greatest ideas sometimes come from there or maybe just something as simple as a great character design 
is like mm -hmm. for some reason you drew a character and it doesn't belong anywhere, has no story, but it looks really cool. So you can't help but make a backstory for this guy or this girl. <laughs> and there's the start of many things. <laughs> that was the start of some of my stories, actually. You see a really, really cool character design in some video game or in some anime or manga. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to do my own version of this guy. And then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I've got a good story in my head. He looks like he might be this and that. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Inspiration has certainly come from that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I should I should try that myself. <laughs> um, There's something to be said for the power of the cool. Yeah, when it comes to doing artwork, yeah. coolness uh, hard to define. But when something looks good and everyone agrees, <laughs> yeah, people, it's very you can very quickly spot those sorts of images. Mm, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so. Clearly, you're very interested in comics, graphic novels, especially mm -hmm. Australian ones, since you also manage the Australian comics and graphic novels database. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can I kind of created us? that um, to help oh, libraries kind of have a database of Australian graphic novels that they can buy. Uh, it's unfortunately uh, the Australian graphic novel um, kind of a field, I guess. It's very, very limited. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people doing their own thing in their own little boxes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they reach out, maybe they have an audience on Kickstarter. But apart from that, there's no formalized network in Australia where people can actually create and publish graphic novels. The big publishing houses do their own stuff, but mostly it's aimed at the nine to 12 demographic. And so mm -hmm. um, because they can't afford to print in color either. So it's mostly in black and white and kind of geared towards the, you know, Darby would be kid audience. Nothing wrong with that, but there's a demand for more sophisticated works out there. And um, just trying to collate them into a single database is just tough because um, mm. I have no way of marketing this stuff to libraries either. Mm. The best I could do is just a database. Like librarians know about graphic novels. Librarians know how popular at least manga is, is in, um, in libraries. Like people read it all the time. So they know that this is a magnet for their patrons. But um, cultivating an Australian graphic novel shelf is something that most libraries are like, they either don't know about it or they don't really know what... You know, how to choose books and things like that. They mostly just buy books straight from um, uh, established publishing houses, you know. So um, there's a system that there where they just actually buy good quality books. But um, yeah, it's uh, very hard to get visibility in these kind of areas. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, Australian comics or graphic novels that have recently come out that stood out to you? Or, well, I guess recently can be very broad if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, not really. Unfortunately, I don't really have the time to spend um, mm. looking at Australian graphic novels and taking note of whatever. The database, um, mostly I just send out messages every now and then asking people to sign, you know, register the books with the database and it needs to have an ISBN mm -hmm. and to be, able, to be able to do that. So web comics are out and so are the kind of uh, flop, comic floppies that are printed with them. Um, the magazine sort of, uh, I don't remember what it's called. Um, the magazine kind of barcode that they have. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain number of, or zines, so there's a certain number of works that just completely cannot be added into the database because it won't be available for libraries to buy and things like spine, a binding and um, uh, kind of book size, the size of the book can make a difference in whether a library can actually physically buy your book or not. There are regulations, like, not regulations, but there are standards on what sort of books libraries can buy. And with comics, because of the DIY um, thing a lot of people um, had make their books like they do with zines or they publish it in an unusual format and that makes it hard for libraries to buy even if they know about it and want to buy it mm -hmm. yep. so it, it's a tough place to be in that um, there is pretty much very little government interest in in developing this area even though mm. it's uh, comics is a massively popular category yes <laughs> yeah and getting yeah, more popular all the time yeah, I'm very lucky in that my local library has a very, very big comic graphic novel manga shelf mm -hmm. and this, mm -hmm. they just keep adapting it, but well, uh, oh, my they library... Would. Mm. I've spoken to many librarians and they tell me the books draw people in, like in a, in a time where public funding mm -hmm. is in a crisis, you know, libraries need to attract as many patrons as they can. And so when a something, a category of books actually makes people come into a library, they're like, yeah, 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 all for it. Yeah. And so well, a lot I mean, of, most libraries these days have massive graphic novel collections because they, they've realized that it attracts people. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a good, it's a good form of storytelling. So 
mm-hmm. all good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so your comics often have a very, very distinct tendency towards the creepy or the horror genre, and you already talked about creepy Stardew Valley. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is so fascinating about the things that scare us? I think, well, for me, it's plumbing my own fears, really, when I write scary stories. Apart from it being challenging to to write a creepy story, um, you are trying to exercise what frightens you. And um, I think I think a lot of horror writers are probably scared of the dark or something. It does, um, that's what drives them to create. In my case, I think creepy stories is something that uh, people find appealing, not just for the scare factor, but because it's just so different from everyday life. You know, um, I think if you live a normal, regular life, sometimes you want some cheap thrills. And I think that's where the appeal comes in. Um, mm-hmm. It's like um, like some people like really, really wholesome stuff. And like I was uh, making a comparison between Graveyard Keeper and Stardew Valley. So Stardew Valley is a very wholesome life sim and um, Graveyard Keeper is like a twisted version, messed up version of that. And that has its um, inherent sense of humor to it as well. It's like a different way of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's very appealing apart from it being hilarious as well <laughs> there's a lot of subversion you can do with horror you know and airing of people's fears and exploring what people are afraid of um can bring a lot of um you know interests i think mm-hmm. yeah i i like reading horror uh watching horror and but i'm i'm a scaredy cat so i mm-hmm. definitely see that as being afraid of the dark and being a horror writer <laughs> yeah it's interesting because horror i think of it as a niche genre, okay? So it's not like romance that everyone can get into or action and adventure that everyone gets into. Horror is, like being a horror fan is very um, niche, but they're also quite fanatical in that there are devotees. I w- Yes, there's, you know, romance devotees and action and adventure fans, but I think that when it comes to horror, the fans are very dedicated and they, you know, catalog all their stuff, you know, quite well. And so it is a genre that if you're able to, to attract people, they like it very much. You know, mm. so I think that horror fans are a bit different to other kinds of um, fans in their, I guess, some um, fervent interest. And there's a lot of horror, uh, a, lot of, a lot of overlap between horror and other kinds of stories, like Stephen King. Like one of the most popular writers of, uh, is Stephen King, and he's a horror writer, but his work kind of overlap with, um, you know, fantasy as well. Mm and what they call might call magical realism but there's the appeal of his work really and um yeah yeah he's way popular so horror is niche but maybe not that niche after all yeah maybe maybe people just like to pretend it's it's more niche than it really is i mean netflix horror series like the, the haunting of hill house have been hugely popular so mm-hmm. clearly the, there's a more general appeal to it I think people can, like, there's a huge difference, there's so many different kinds of horror. I think people, some mm. people don't like gross out horror, you know, or That's torture true. porn or anything like that. Mm. If it's something, if you can creep people out without, you know, blood splattering the walls, then that's considered a plus. A lot of people like that kind of stuff. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, horror is about exploring our worst impulses, you know, the, the ugly side of um, human relationships. It's not like a fantasy where you have a romantic comedy and two people come together that has its feel good moments, but, um, a horror in that situation would be un- exploring the unsavory side of um, such relationships. And I guess mm-hmm. people sometimes relate to it as well. It's like, after all, real, real life isn't like a Hollywood movie when two people get together and everything's wonderful. Um, in a horror story about two people, you're more likely to have a troubled marriage, you know, mm-hmm. people dealing with grief when, than other sorts of things that people find relatable and kind of exercises some of their deeper fears as well. Mm, that's true. I, I like that point about horror movies often featuring uh, elements like grief and that, that being able to be explored in the horror genre. Mm, troubled people, yeah. Mm. I mean, you could explore troubled people in drama as well, but I think horror is, um, people want to be entertained in various ways and sometimes horror is a bit, a bit more in your face or at least a bit more unexpected than drama because drama, trouble, you know, features plenty of troubled people, but let's face it, drama about troubled person, do I want to see this? Sounds a bit slow. Conversely, if there's a horror story about a troubled person, well, maybe that will have something interesting in it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, well, you, your three volume series, The Dreaming, definitely has some horror elements to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also 
very uniquely Australian in some ways. It's it's setting. I mean, you you said you weren't specifically inspired by Picnic at Hanging Rock, but if you know both stories, then the setting is definitely reminiscent of it. And of mm -hmm. course, also your eventual solution to the mystery. So mm -hmm. how did you come up with that? Well, I should have to, you know, forewarn people that my eventual solution to the mystery is a little bit problematic because it kind of abuses Aboriginal culture mm. back at a time where, you know, cultural appropriation was an issue. But now I guess, um, you know, it is not really acceptable. So I won't go into that too much to say, except to say that it is kind of offensive to mm. Aborigines, what I did there and Aboriginal culture. But anyway, um, in terms of, uh, you know, why and how I came up with that kind of setting, um, it is based partly off real life. Um, I did mention in one of my um, notes at the back that a friend, or it's more like a classmate, I didn't know her very well, disappeared while bushwalking in Tasmania. And I didn't, I found out this out through friends of friends. And it's like, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? This happened to them. And uh, the circumstances of her disappearance were very strange because she was going from point A to point B. Uh, she was meant to meet someone at point B, never showed up. They did a search, they found her gear. She was all set up for the night, could not find her. And so people were saying, well, what's, is it like, just what happened? You know, is she mm. having, is she troubled in some way? Yes, her parents were getting a divorce, but um, apart from that, she, there was nothing to indicate that she was, you know, wanting to do something to herself. Um, but then people were like, well, maybe she just walked into a, a hole in the ground or something. And it's like, how exactly does that happen? It does happen, but it's strange explanation. And then people are like, well, what if someone did something? And it's like, that's the last thing that people want to know because you see movies like Wolf Creek. Mm -hmm. and it's, like, it's like, no, you know, that is absolutely the worst possible outcome. And so it becomes this um, mystery that has no ending, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, that kind of um, fascinates people because I know her as a, a very beautiful girl like she was one of the she wasn't conventionally pretty but she had the kind of supermodel vibe where her she was very tall and very thin and her features were very sharp and distinct um definitely not textbook pretty but that's what made her fascinating like as a an attractive girl in that she had these sharp um strong features and you know that those those laser sharp eyes and yes would definitely be a supermodel not a conventional you know kind of a swimsuit model i guess but uh, that kind of gives you a certain impression of um, how how she comes across in my mind and someone to disappear like that. It's like, wow, oh, she has her whole life in front of her, you know, all the, mm. you know, that kind of feeling. So um, um, her disappearance, yeah, it's kind of still sticks in my mind and I wonder what happened to her occasionally. Hopefully it's she, like she didn't suffer, you know, mm. but you don't know that. Yeah, so. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I can definitely see why that, especially unanswered, mysteries or that that was like picking a hanging rock as well that was an unanswered mystery of course the girl came back one of them came mm. back and there is a big question mark about what happened to her yes but i guess after that incident and when i was um trying to submit work to tokyo pop at the time which is an american company and i thought i should make a point of my australianness and kind of introduce americans to such some australian ideas about the bush Mm -hmm. you know I, that that was the first story that came to mind not just because of my classmate but because I think that um the Australian kind of um uh, relationship with the bush is really worth exploring in that it is something that is I think mm -hmm. feared in this country as uh, the bush is seen as a kind of untamable wild mysterious place where people just disappear and I've had some weird ins like experiences while going bushwalking that is unlike any, you know, the Australian landscape when it comes to the bush and not just the outback, that's a different kind of feeling, uh, still mysterious, but in talking about the Australian bush, um, because I think it's deciduous, or is that is that what it means? Deciduous is that just evergreen? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's an evergreen kind of environment. So the seasons don't really happen here. And uh, because of that, sometimes when I go walking in the bushes in other, like in kind of the woodlands in other kinds of parts of the country, uh, they have seasons. You walk in the British woods, the American woods. Mm. I went to the jungles of um, Vietnam, Malaysia. They look very different. All of them look very different to each other. The Australian bush, I guess, uh, looks the same constantly. And um, because of that, it's hard to find landmarks. So I've, there's mm. been times when I go bushwalking and it's like, whoa, 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 where, where the heck am I? 
And this is something that is more specific to the temperate areas of Australia rather than the rainforest area, like Daintree. Like in Queensland, again, it's different. And I don't actually feel the same way about the Queensland um, tropical kind of uh, rainforest. Um, but here in the kind of more temperate New South Wales kind of area, the bushlands can get very samey. And there are times that I've gone bushwalking and then it's like, hang on, hang on, am I, is this the right track? Like everything looks the same. <laughs> and I've had some, there's been some freak out moments where I'm wondering where the heck am I? Am I lost? Help me. <laughs> you know, can't find a landmark. Yeah, but then I can't see the sky and all that. So I just kind of hang around and wait for to hear sounds and then rush back to people when I hear them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but sometimes when you lose the trail and uh, you're far away from some anyone and you don't hear people, you, I have, I've had some major freak out moments. So I'm going to die here. Oh dear. Yeah, you know, those right. kind of feelings. I'm glad, I'm glad you made it out. So. <laughs> but oh yeah, it was very minor. I was just very barely off the track, really. It's just that sometimes <laughs> when you're in a pocket with no people, Mm -hmm. you start getting strange ideas it's like where am i did i come back here and it's like i'm not it's it's hard to recognize the trail in in the bush sometimes depending on mm -hmm. where you are and that's just nice. the nature of, of australian bushlands and it's hilarious because sometimes americans don't really understand that i in the dreaming in the first volume i had someone some intern rewrote the name bush to brush and it's like no <laughs> I, I think um australians i mean americans don't really understand what the australian bush is Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a term that's unique to this country so that's why the intern messed that up so i'm such mm -hmm. my editor please fix so that makes no sense <laughs> <laughs> well it shows you the, the cultural difference i suppose oh absolutely a lot of the american readers of the dreaming didn't even know it was set in australia despite a picture of you know the sydney harbour bridge on the first page and it's like yeah, i guess they think... if you're young enough you won't recognize these kinds of um mm. global architecture icons i guess <laughs> <laughs> makes sense um so i know you said you didn't want to talk about the ending very much and i understand that and i'm glad that mm -hmm. you brought it up but if you had the chance now would you then uh like to do something different with the ending change it yeah i probably would just change it completely and mm -hmm. remove the aboriginal elements but that mm -hmm. kind of um uh cultural appropriation issues aside but that kind of um ruins the themes of the story a little bit because at the end of the day the dreaming is about dumb white Europeans going into a place that they don't understand, the bush, and then suffering for and being punished for that. Mm -hmm. So that says a lot about, um, you know, this history of this country as well, in that a bunch of, you know, Europeans come and they dump their convicts here and they don't understand anything about the land. It's just like, a, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like any other land. But of course it isn't. Every land has its own unique qualities. And um, the story in the dreaming, if it's kept in its original state, yes, that would be about that. Without it, it might probably benefit a bit from a complete rewriting, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that will work, really, because uh, it is it is a story that came out a long time ago. Right. That probably isn't, isn't culturally acceptable in 2020. But um, mm. also, if I had to, like, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't rewrite it because that's basically whitewashing. What you, I mean, what you've done. You know, um, mm -hmm. the cultural appropriation was a bad idea, was a mistake, uh, but pretending that it didn't happen is probably worse. So I guess it has some historical value in that it was made in a time where cultural appropriation wasn't considered as offensive as it is now. Mm -hmm. But who knows, um, depending on, um, you know, an Aboriginal person reading it, depending on how they feel, uh, I think there'll be a range of reactions. Mm -hmm. Some people might probably really hate it and some people might be like, yeah, I don't really care. So it kind right. of depends on the person. That makes sense. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I already said that I read the uh, German version of it by mistake. Um, <laughs> in it, there are some additional notes on your inspiration in Australia. And that made me think, um, was this made for the German version alone? Or was it in the English version? From what you said now, I'm, I'm guessing it was in the English version as well, because it was yeah. more on international audience right yeah i originally never intended the for the dreaming to be published or you know bought and sold and read in australia because the company right. i was working for tokyo pop was very clear about this is for the american audience we're aiming for 14 year old teen girls give me something based on that you know and i said yeah disappearing school girls pretty dresses australian <laughs> bush yay <laughs> so i didn't think that um, it would be in any way read or sold in Australia. And that's why I put these notes at the back saying, introducing Australia to you by there's a whole bunch of states and, um, you know, Australians are like this and that and kangaroos are fun and, you know, that, that kind of <laughs> stuff. 
<laughs> yes, so um, that was meant to be for an American audience to introduce them to a country that they probably didn't know much about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that in some it's it's so different to America. I was friends with a bunch of um, American art manga artists at the time who was all pitching to Tokyo Pop, um, more or less. And um, just just talking to them is that they just have a, such a different attitude towards a lot of things. And that was quite mm -hmm. eye opening. The early days of the internet. You know, when you mm -hmm. were, you know, kicking around the internet and meeting all these people from different countries and thinking, oh, you know, you're so different. We speak the lang same language, but, um, you know, the yeah. way you think is so different. <laughs> I, I particularly like your map of Australia. You say, this, this is where schoolgirls go missing. This is where American tourists go missing. <laughs> it's like a map of yeah, Australian Australia tourists. Yeah, hilarious viewpoint of Australia sometimes. Um, they have this fascination with the outback. Mm. And I remember in a comic, um, a Vertigo comic, there were the opening panel. The story is called the um, Why the Last Man, and the opening panel is of the main character's girlfriend who recently went to Australia, and she's jogging in the outback. And I was like, when I saw that comic, I was out of FL. Like it was so funny because um, I don't know people who actually jog in the outback. Like who does that? Actually, having been to the outback, and it's like this is not a place where you should would jog in. No, there's nothing for, like, I went to uh, Alice Springs. I oh, know they're not Alice Springs. Uluru, actually. There's an uh, airstrip, and then there's a hotel in the middle of nowhere, and then there's Uluru. At least that was back when, 20 years ago, when I went. I don't know if they've actually built anything more to that, but it's like, why would anyone jog here? It's freezing at night. It's really hot <laughs> during the day. This is not a place why, where anybody would jog at all outside. Um, so when I saw that, I thought, you, I mean, Americans really have a whacked out idea of what people are actually doing in the outback. You know, Australians don't actually drive around the outback that much. <laughs> yeah, but this is something that foreign tourists do especially. And so when people go missing, they're nearly always foreign tourists because they just did something stupid in the outback. And they're not mm -hmm. supposed to do. Yeah, so, or um, they're 19th people, century schoolgirls. <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't go missing in the outback. They went missing in the bush. So that's very different. Oh, yeah. That's a very <laughs> urban thing to do. That's what I like. Australians do go in the bush and they do go missing. Uh, very mm. rarely do they travel in the outback. The way that many foreign tourists do and i think you know this, that's just right. weird yeah, yeah i think i think since I, since i made this mistake right now i think the, the bush and the outback sort of kind of merge in the non-australian imagination probably definitely not in the australian imagination <laughs> very different things in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah. that makes sense from what you said it's just from an outside perspective that it's often used kind of interchangeably which is wrong then um, so oh definitely <laughs> um this it's such a different culture in the outback as well like um rural australia is exactly that if you're wandering around rural uh, new south wales it would be a lot of farmland mm -hmm. in queensland it would be mostly rainforest so not much farmland there's tea plantations in um, queensland so they do grow there's a lot of you know plantations there that grow tropical more tropical kinds of crops but it is about farming once mm -hmm. you go into the outback that's cattle stations you know mm -hmm. so uh that the industry there anyway so it's like that's a completely different culture mm. wouldn't say the, the stockman let's so to speak wouldn't say cowboy that would be wrong it would be the stockman who is a different culture to to american cowboys but that would be cattle stations there and the people there are very different to the farming communities that you would find in the more temperate states mm -hmm. yeah, and there are also aboriginal um kind of i wouldn't call them settlements but the kind of you know aboriginal groups living there which is their home anyway so um there's that Mm. as well so i would say it's a very very different thing mm -hmm. i mean there are have been australian movies that address the outback that i think is kind of funny like um interesting comparison when it comes to picking Kangaroo rock that would be priscilla queen of the desert women oriented i guess is about three drag queens but um their take on the australian outback is more banal road movie <laughs> than it is compared to the picking hanging rock so you know it's so, such a different thing Fascinating. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so <laughs> we keep talking about Picnic at Hanging Rock. Um, <laughs> what's your impression of the novel and maybe its adaptations if you've seen them? I was actually given the novel for as a prize when I was uh, in year seven. So I read it a long time ago and um, I, my, my impression of the book is kind of vague. Like the book itself was all pretty vague, to be honest. And I don't, I don't think I understood it very well. It, it felt like half a, you know, mis, uh, half a newspaper clipping or something. 
and like the impression that it gives because it never really explains anything. Mm-hmm. I think the movie left a much stronger impression on me and um, because the movie was also really dreamy but also kind of strange. I do remember these segments where the girls disappeared and he was like, like there was a fl- bunch of flashing images, like a bunch of stuff happened and I'm like, whoa, what was that? And it's like, it's never, again, it's never clear what happened to the girls except that they disappeared. And mm-hmm. it was very eerie the way that sequence happened. You know, so that kind of stuck in my mind more, the way that the images kind of flashed and the sound effects, the weird screeches I remember there was on the soundtrack. Yep. So for me, it was like, again, like a movie that was just like, huh? <laughs> you know, that stuck in your mind because you're like, oh, the first half of it is like so dreamy and, mm-hmm. and pleasant and super girly and all that. And then, da, 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 da. you know, stuff, intense stuff happens and you're like, what? Yes. And then you'll wait, wait for the solution and there is none. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's um, uh, kind of more representative of the 70s style of filmmaking where mm-hmm. people were a lot more open to experimentation. Nowadays, people experiment as well, but um, people also have expectations that you'll give them the ending of the mystery, which would have harmed the movie and the book because there is no, you know, it, it's only a mystery because there's no explanation. Yes. And once there is one, it's, it's just no longer exciting or mysterious. Mm, so I, I mean, this, this is a great job. an official unofficial official ending by Joan Lindsay and it definitely makes sense that it was left out of the published book because you're well, right what just... happened <laughs> I'm I'm not sure I remember it correctly but I believe they all turned into crabs and and went into a, <laughs> an opening in the rock and that's how they disappeared it that is makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes <laughs> and it's like crabs okay that was unexpected why crabs I don't, I don't know, but it, I read recently that a lot of animals keep evolving into crab shape. So maybe that was a prescient prediction by Joan Lindsay. I don't know. Um, if you want to, I can send you a scan of that chapter. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then maybe you can you can tell me what you think of that. Yeah, Have you seen that? The... Definitely hmm? sounds like sci-fi now. Yes, <laughs> it's yes, a sci-fi it story. Yeah, they ran into an alien beam and kind of evolved them into crab-like creatures, and then just kind of walked into a hole. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, kind okay. of like that. It's, it's it's still strange, but in a very different way than the novels yeah. without the final chapter. And yeah. apparently, that was Joan Lindsay wanted it to, to be in the novel, but was advised by her editor to put it out. Good idea. And that's Good how advice. we ended up. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was. Was, the novel may not be as popular if that's how it ended. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> With the mystery, yeah. <laughs> uh, have you seen the newest adaptation of Picnic at Hanging Rock? The the TV show the with no, Natalie I Dorma. Not at all. Um, I saw the I think Wolfgang Peterson. I think that was the seventies. That that was the only um, mm. version that I saw uh, that mm. I've seen. That was a while ago, anyway. Mm-hmm. But um, is the TV show worth watching? I, I think so. Uh, it's, it's, it does some interesting changes to the novel. Um, one of the girls is being depicted as, as having Aboriginal ancestry. And that's that's also dealt with in go. the... <laughs> hmm? no, I mean, no, I, I, I just thought it's hilarious. That's all. They had to bring the <laughs> Aboriginal element in. I mean, I did, so I could, I could see why people do that. <laughs> um. It's it's very queer in some ways, which is good. Mm-hmm. So uh, give do give it a try. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the original picking hanging rock was quite queer as well. From mm-hmm. what I, remember. Um, I think this is this is there's even a lot of schoolgirl so. crushes and um, all that, and kind of the whole repressed sexuality of Victorian mm. styles. Yes, schools. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, so imagine that, but but even more explicit. So there's, there's a wow. lot of that going on. Is that so. a good thing? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, sometimes I think these things are best left to the imagination. You know? mm. um, it's I mean, it's not like, like, it's oh, not like you know? explicit love scenes or anything, but it is, it is oh, increased. So less subtle than the original. Yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> originally it was quite subtle, but mm. that's part of the appeal, I think. <laughs> but we'll see. Well, like, um, different times calls for different sensibilities. Mm, that makes sense. Um. So uh, <laughs> going to the next question, um, and this, this hope pretty steers us away from Picnic at Hanging Rock now. Uh, okay. What kind of research goes into your comics? So the historical ones, the fantasy ones, and perhaps even when it comes to backgrounds, because 
I know that that takes a lot of research as well to, to visually mm. represent something else, a history. Yeah. I think when it comes to backgrounds for the more fantastical stuff, it's just like whatever goes, to be honest, it is about <laughs> high fantasy. But for the historical stuff, I did a lot of research. Um, and some of it can be quite hard, like um, for the Women Who Were Kings series. So that's a, his, a bunch of biographies about famous historical queens. I was at 10, I was um, the second one on um, China, the only female Chinese emperor, was at 10. Um, that was done for a master's degree at a university of Macquarie. So I'm working on a PhD there as well, but um, that suggests the level of research that is done into this. It is pretty university level to read a fair amount of, um, you know, books on the subject, uh, on academic papers when I can where I can find them. Um, that was most certainly true for um, well, less so for Elizabeth because um, I tried to use some uh, movie references for mm. um, Queen Elizabeth, and that was a bad choice because uh, there's a lot of historical inaccuracies in a lot of the movies, like the Kate Blanchett one, which I loved. But let's face it, it's highly historically in in inaccurate, including the backgrounds. So when I do try and do um, background research. Um, uh, with Egypt, like uh, with Hatshepsut, so she was the female pharaoh. Um, with Hatshepsut, it was a little bit easier because um, people do recreate um, ancient Egyptian kinds of um, um, temples and stuff in as best of ways they can. So that actually can be found online, is that there's a mm. digital Kanak project. So a Kanak is a temple from that era that um, Hatshepsut worshipped in occasionally as, you know, like a God's wife. So people have recreated that over the years and so you're able to find what things looked like during um, Hatshepsut's time so that was very helpful and Hatshepsut is obviously is also very heavily studied mm. as a figure in academia and the same for Wudeten she's quite well fairly well studied not as much as Hatshepsut but um, still fairly well documented in western academia when it comes to Sinology but what I really looked at that I thought was great for Wu Ten was some of the TV series produced by the Chinese government, because then they they were taken very seriously and they would try to, to get the historical accuracy as close as possible. So that's been very helpful. Mm. Um, those kind of government produced TV series. And it's the same for Catherine the Great, which I'm researching on now. Unfortunately, it's a bit on hold because of my PhD. But um, I find the um, TV series produced by Russian state TV, those sorts of things, uh, they tend to be able to film at um, the original places where um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the queen, or in this case, Catherine lived. Um, some of the, like uh, Oren Bian, I think that's, um, I probably butchered the pronunciation of that. Um, that's a cultural heritage site these days. And they were able to film their very nice place, house that um, where she lived with her um, former husband, so to speak, when they were married. And she lived there. And of course, there's a winter palace and all that. This, these places are still around. Most of them are still around. Mm -hmm. in St. Petersburg and all that. So um, it's been hard to get interiors of these kind of palaces, but they kind of look a particular way. So I can have some leeway with that. It's more of an issue of um, getting it right how people more or less dress. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the differences between, because if people kind of get confused with um, medieval European dress, like uh, how differently people dressed in Elizabethan times versus how differently they dressed in Catherine the Great's times, you know, because it's pretty miles apart. It's actually miles apart when you actually look yes. at it. But it's kind of making these small distinctions. That's a bit of a challenge. And mm. apart from that, getting the politics of the era right. Yeah, so it's a, it is a lot of clothing and um, background research, but I kind of, um, I do as much of it as I can, but there's always um, issues with um, errors and things like that. And that's, you know, I, I tell people, this is, you know, where I got my art research from and mm. it may not be correct you know but I do try and as much as possible make it as historically accurate as I can but mm. I'll you know kudos to those tv series made by um you know uh actual countries government because they tend to be the most respectful mm -hmm. and true to history and does this this research that you do also influence your fantasy work because it, it seems like you've done really a lot of intensive research and I could imagine that flowing into other parts of your work as well yeah i try and do it but it's more like building systems you know building a a doing typical world building stuff that i mm. think it is is a different kind of challenge mm. um with fantasy stuff you do try and bend the rules a little bit because it mm. doesn't really matter all that much you know whether um whether certain things are historically accurate because of course it's a fantasy world it wouldn't be but that doesn't mean you don't build an internal history in your world and kind of fill it out as much as you can 
and um, think about how history shapes the kind of um, the, the some of the cultural customs and things like that and some of the uh, political um, kind of engagements in that world. So that's a very different way of thinking, in my opinion, mm. in how you world build and how you make um, sense of how how and why things are a particular way in your fantasy world. Mm. Yeah, so it's a different skill set altogether, I think, uh, compared to doing nonfiction research. And the nonfiction stuff is really, really time consuming as well, because um, different sources say different things. And sometimes a person's, um, the historians take on a particular figure um, clashes with that of public perception mm -hmm. of what they what they were like and uh, even sometimes when it comes to the um, government produced kinds of tv series they do tend to talk about a certain um, aspect of a queen's character more so than things that I feel are important like for example I don't know why but um, when people do tv series of these famous queens they tend to skip over their childhoods <laughs> and it's like why do you, you know, you just present us with a teenager who's 14 already. It's like, what happened to the first 14 years of her life? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a, in the case of Elizabeth, it was, let's present her. Let's present you with a 24-year-old Elizabeth who's about to go on the throne. Well, what about the stuff that happened before she got to being 24? Because Elizabeth came close to death several times as a young teenager. You know, apparently people just don't want to talk about these kinds of stuff, even though they're the most formative years of the Queen's life. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little problematic because once you do know about what happened to them as young children when they were at their most powerless, it does kind of inform you of the woman they would later turn into. Mm -hmm. you know, that I think that has a huge influence and so I think people neglect that sometimes. And as a result, some of these TV series has a rather incomplete picture or at mm -hmm. least a um, less sympathetic picture of a particular queen. Yeah, and nice. I think that could be improved. That's, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. So I, I'm guessing this is what you're trying in your uh, in your series as well, and to, to give that deeper sense? Going from someone's birth to their death. Mm. You know, sometimes it's not the most exciting story to talk about a theory of someone's life where they're just a little kid. But, so, but I think that's something that you shouldn't leave out. Mm -hmm. Because I think some of the, the most formative things about these women happen to them as children when they were at their most powerless mm -hmm. and it kind of explains some of their later behavior when they want to cling on to power and given some of their childhood you could see why mm -hmm. you know this is what they went through as a child and it's like yeah you could see why they were like that later on mm -hmm. an example would be elizabeth um because she was a princess until her mother was beheaded and then she had her uh, title stripped from her and she was declared illegitimate and then shunted to some castle to the extent where her governess had to write a letter to the King Henry VIII asking for cloth so she can make clothes for Elizabeth. She had nothing to wear. Mm -hmm. You know, that was when she was six, seven, eight. And it's like, certainly that had a huge effect on Elizabeth, who was an intelligent kid, very intelligent child. And she must have felt that the death of her mother meant that she did was nobody all of mm -hmm. a sudden. You know, so that had a huge influence to how she behaved in adult life and that she was aware that one can be born a rightful princess and heir to the throne and suddenly have it all lost just because her dad didn't like her mom anymore mm -hmm. and just ch chopped her head off and that was it. You know, that she might be the rightful daughter of a king, but so what? It didn't mean anything mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. So that actually, I think, had a great effect on her as an adult and how she ruled and how she felt as, as, a, as a lone queen on the throne. Who was actually who was she was pretty paranoid to be honest and uh, insecure understandable. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and i think maybe the reason biographers often leave out these these crucial periods of of time in one's life is maybe because children are so powerless and we kind of tend to ignore them as a society so it's i think it's good to to change that when it comes to biographies Yes, well, biographies nearly always talk about her childhood, so that's not an issue here. Mm. It's actually Hollywood adaptations of Elizabeth's story that's the okay. problem, in that they tend to leave that out. And as a result, I, I, I found Kate Blanchett's acting fantastic in Elizabeth, based on what that was given to her and what she mm. could do from the script. But if she this story had included Elizabeth's childhood in there, mm. like Kate's performance would be so different simply because like what she like there was no way she'll be so relaxed and so secure in her position as queen because, mm -hmm. because Kate does come across as um you know Kate's version of Elizabeth comes across as pretty you know secure 
mm-hmm. in her in the way that she felt and the way the confidence there was this like an un- understated confidence about her and I was thinking I don't think so the real mm-hmm. life Elizabeth I don't think is anything like that but that's not Kate's fault she was just yeah. given something to work with and I think she did a great job given you know based mm-hmm. on what she was given but is it right. true to the real historical Elizabeth I don't I don't think so mm-hmm. yeah that, that would make sense <laughs> Um, now going to a completely different kind of work. We've talked about fantasy, historical, but two of your works on your website are actually Legend of Zelda fan fiction. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've already talked to some Australian authors about fan fiction before, so now I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love fan fiction. It's great. Um, <laughs> I wrote my fan fiction at the time because I was interested in just testing out the, the mix of prose and comics that the Legend of Zelda um, fan fiction was written in. And I found that it was a great way to um, test out a format on randos because people always are willing to read fan fiction if they're a fan of that particular series. So yes. the experimentation went in without any hitches. Basically, people say, yeah, I got, it was weird at first, but got used to it, you know, just read the story. People didn't seem to care about the format at all. <laughs> they cared about that it was Legend of Zelda. And I was like, well, that's promising. So, I should, you know, that was just an experiment. But I've always loved fan fiction because there's such good writing going on there. And there's so many people out there who just are great writers but have no interest in it as, a, as an occupation or even putting out their own book or creating their own worlds. They just like to play with other people's characters and show their love of mm-hmm. people and how they feel about, oh, you know, what if this person got together with this other person and this and that happened? You know, so it's like playing with Lego in someone else's world or something. Yeah, so very yeah. common. Um, I think some people are offended by fan fiction. I've heard that some older authors can find it very offensive to have their characters being taken by others and then, you know, all these fun being had. But I would, I think it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But people would not do that unless they loved your characters and see something in it that makes them want to do this. You know, and um, I think a, a lot of works out there are fan fiction, to be honest, <laughs> even when they're completely original. <laughs> You know, we're all inspired by what we love and we create what we do because we saw something that we loved and wanted to do something different. I mean, similar, but different. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what fan fiction is like. Um, I, especially in the age of the internet where the sharing economy is such a big thing and such kind of underpins the internet where just people take stuff and then they name it to death. And it's like, yeah, you know, I don't mind that culture. Um, but I grew up with the internet and I'm very much part of the digital generation. So my attitude is kind of unusual. But I think the older attitude might just eventually die off because we're such, we live in such a different world now. That's Maybe true. Different. But I think as much as, as fan fiction in the current format is a product of the internet, I, I think you're right. It's always been there. And lots of stories okay. that aren't called fan fiction are definitely fan fiction. Like you could sure. even go to uh, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy and say, well, that's clearly fan fiction of the Bible with an mm-hmm. insert oh, character. Totally. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much stuff out there can be considered mm. fan fiction. And um, it's true not just of Western stories. It's true in Eastern stories as well. <laughs> Crap ton of stories of fan fiction. People have written, you know, Journey to the West. People have written mm. sequels to Journey to the West and centuries after. Yes. And apparently it's not a very good read. That's why it's not popular. But there you go. You know, people love it as I'm going to write my own sequel to this thing. And this that was in um, probably 300 years ago. So... Mm. Journey to the West was probably written in the 14th century, you know, uh, or maybe 16th century around somewhere around that time. And several centuries later, someone decided to write their you know, sequel. And that's very common. Mm. And I guess the, everything gets respectable after a certain time. So um, that counts as a classic too, even if nobody likes to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the Journey only to the West too. Hmm? Sorry? It's like the sequel to Journey to the West. Like Journey to the West is well known. Lots of people read it, still do. But the sequel, less well known. <laughs> But it's there and it's a classic because it's hundreds of years old still. So even if no one wants to read it, right. there is a journey to the West too. <laughs> yeah, and then that's a classic now, even though it started as fan fiction. It really, it's just a matter of time. Uh, so I think yeah. there's a lot of people who are very embarrassed about things that they have written that are now classics. Because <laughs> there are some stories, at least in um, ancient literature, in Chinese literature, that was just meant to be circulated amongst family and friends. You know, people do not expect it to become viral and yes. that's turned into a thing. It's like, oh my God, now I've got to write more because it's so popular. Mm. And there are, I think Journey of the West originally was not meant to be public. You know, a lot of these early, because the novel, at least in the West, in its conception, was considered a vulgar kind of 
you know, form of storytelling. It wasn't mm -hmm. really a classy thing to be seen writing a novel. Of course, that's changed now. Yes. But whenever anything new happens, it's considered crude and vulgar. And then over time, it kind of gets respectable. And I guess so, I guess so that's what's really happening nice with well. comics, graphic novels, right? Um, I guess so. But in some countries, it's always been respectable. The French has always found it respectable. The Japanese mm. never considered it respectable, but respected it as, only as a commercial force, you know, which is, is most certainly powerful at. But I think the Japanese are really proud of um, manga and anime culture, at least um, at least mm. seeing its global influence. Mm -hmm. Because most Japanese are extremely baffled as to why people want to read Japanese manga. <laughs> I was like, why do you want to read this? And it's like, well, some things are universal and people don't get that because people think it's so mm -hmm. Japanese that people understand eating sushi and going to the bath house and doing all these Japanese stuff. And it's like, you'll be surprised. You know, at the end <laughs> of the day, it's people doing yes. people stuff. Yes. That has its appeal. Absolutely. That makes sense. <laughs> So would you would you still write uh, Legend of Zelda fan fiction, maybe to Breath of the Wild? I haven't played some of the later Zelda games because they're all 3D and I suffer some dire motion sickness. So mm, I okay. unfortunately haven't been able to play Breath of the Wild, but I'm not really sure I like the direction the Zelda games have gone in as well. Mm -hmm. I prefer the more old school kind of um, dungeoneering experiences than the more open world running around experiences. I, it actually mm. harkens back to the original Legend of Zelda which I still love as a game, but it's so technologically different now compared to the old Legend of Zelda. It's like, yeah, I get it. It's an open world, but it's just so different. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, because I don't play 3D games, then I'm sure I'm missing out a lot on Legend of Zelda. But one thing is to be said is that uh, the weapon durability thing is just stupid. <laughs> and I don't want to play a game <laughs> with that. <laughs> well, it has its challenges, I, I mm -hmm. can tell you. <laughs> I do think it's interesting in what it does storytelling wise because you're kind of telling your own story through this very open format. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, I think and, they do I know, it quite well. Mm, and and it is interesting because it's so open that you imbue Link with the characteristics you kind of want him to have. Mm -hmm. I know that that mine has a very hard time focusing on his quest because there's so much else to do, <laughs> like catching That's butterflies or riding bears. So. Yeah, that's the power of silent protagonists, I guess, who do everything True. and he expresses himself entirely through action. Yes. He is whatever you want him to be. And Link is one of those forever popular characters that is even more of a blank slate than someone like Mario or Sonic. I mean, Sonic is 90% attitude anyway. And um, Mario is an Italian plover. Everyone knows that. <laughs> but Link, I think, is still is actually meant, um, remains a more mysterious figure mm. than either of these two. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, he's also largely humanoid, I, I guess, <laughs> and, <laughs> and a kind of like a, a, a help and elf thing, I guess. Yeah. So a lot of people do project on him, and I think that's a good mm. thing. Yeah. He's yeah. quite gender bending lately, late as well. So that was I thought that was quite interesting. Mm. True, absolutely, and I mean, lots of people who think that Link is Zelda and Zelda is well. <laughs> and well, that's what fan fiction is for. If you've ever read Legend <laughs> of Zelda fan fiction anything goes like people have some weird fantasies that's for sure <laughs> oh very true and if you read fan fiction you know about sometimes more than you'd asked for but that's the fun of it <laughs> yeah it's like wow people are into that half of reading fan fiction is just like wow someone finds this good <laughs> like if someone wrote this they want to do that they, they i know they they get turned on by this Oh, yes. I've I, read some seriously yes. weird stuff that I had to stop halfway because it's like, this is just too weird. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah, I had that too. But then, you know, to each their own. Mm -hmm. Well, they seem to be really enjoying themselves. So it's like, I'll be to you. It's not hurting anyone. So mm, Exactly. <laughs> and you just know that there's someone out there who is totally into the exact same thing and is totally into this particular <laughs> fanfic and is totally bookmarking and favoriting it and, you know, emailing the creator, begging them to write more. <laughs> And that's that's good, you know. Everybody has something that they like, and we don't necessarily have to understand all of it. But oh, there's there no go. way I could possibly understand some of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's something most fan fiction readers and writers can relate to. There's just some things you read and it's like, okay, I'm just gonna back away from this now. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, it, I find it interesting that you used fan fiction to to test out your comics pro style. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what, what can you tell us about that? I, I think it's such an interesting combination, but the, why did you start with it and, and what's the appeal for you? It was a complete accident, really. Um, the original appeal for me was that I thought um, it would be an interesting way to tell a story and add more content to an actual story mm -hmm. and kind of fill in the margins. I thought it would be also be less work than drawing traditional comics, but that turned out to be not true. Uh, it takes as much as much work to do a comics work, uh, prose work than it is to do a traditional kind of a uh, graphic novel. Um, not in the technical sense where you're sitting down drawing so much, but just in the world building sense. It's like mm. there is the story just you write a story in comics prose, it has a tendency to, to sprawl anyway, more so than if you were doing a story that, um, that is just a comic. So that was unexpected. But the real reason why it started was that um, I, when I worked with Dean Koontz and he's largely a prose writer, is that I've that was when I first realized that prose writers can be very protective of their prose. The thing about adaptation is that you're going to have to butcher someone's work and chop out like 90% of it to adapt it into a comic. And I think that prose writers get very upset by that process. It's like they just can't cope. And so when I worked, started working with Kylie and she said, oh, here's my manuscript. Can you adapt it? And I was like, oh, no, we're going to have a Dra dramatic situation on my hands whereas like Kylie understood that you have to chop out half of it but it's going to be like oh my soul is being ripped by my body I mean that's probably what's going to feel like for her so I just said to her maybe there is a middle ground where I can preserve as much of the prose as possible and only you know um create a, a graphic novel the exciting bits that everyone wants to see right and the boring bits you know the boring <laughs> modern bits I'll just ignore that right and just draw the fun ancient Chinese stuff with all the white tigers and all this, you know, all the, the ancient Chinese stuff. Yeah, so that would be more fun for me as well. So that's why I just took a manuscript and just turned about a half of it into comics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that worked out really well. And it kind of unexpectedly worked out, whether in it's in sales or it's in the actual fi final product. It's like, yeah, it's, it's highly readable. And it's like, how did this even happen? As like, I didn't expect it to work as well. Like I thought it would be like a bit of a disaster. But uh, the fact that it worked out well was a surprise and a pleasant one. Unfortunately, um, while the book sold quite well and had a certain printing, the publishing houses don't really know what to do with it. And um, booksellers really don't like the format because it's been tried before. So not in the exact same way, not with comics, but um, people have tried to do illustration to prose and stuff like that. And these kind of books rarely do well. Hmm. And um, I don't think it's because necessarily that people are repelled by it. It's like, um, because books are such a crap shoot these days. A uh, format doesn't sell books, the story does, you know? Mm -hmm. There's been some great stories that just didn't sell for whatever reason. And if they happen to be an illustrated prose, it's like they blame the format instead of the story because sometimes things just don't sell. So it, because of stuff like that, that um, people are very wary of um, these kind of formats, which is unfortunate because as far as I can can tell with the Legend of Zelda experiment, people just don't care. They want a good story. You know, the format never stopped anyone from reading that Zelda fanfic. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I like I love illustrated books, and I think there should be more that aren't mm -hmm. just for the the child's uh, for children's literature because I think adults would enjoy it just as much. Oh yeah, and yeah. I think people the, like small share. Yes, know, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, it's not, the format is not turning anybody off. No, no. I think it's it's exciting to have both. I mean, I love comics. I love novels. There we go. Comics prose. I've got everything. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's a great thing. I think comics prose leans more towards comics than it does in prose. Mm -hmm. But um, it depends on where your starting point is. Um, for me, I kind of created in comics first and that kind of reverse engineers the panels. But I've also written stories first and then just slap the panels in as well. And in Kylie's case, that was Small Shen, she gave me the manuscript and I converted it. So it can, it's doable either way. Mm. Though it kind of depends on people's writing style as well. So um, if I was given more comics prose by other people to convert, that might be very different. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how it might turn out. I don't think we've kind of um, in any way reached potential of what this format can do. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain things that I wasn't able to do. Like, for example, Create scenario, like there is a scenario that I would like to create, but never actually had a chance to, is that when you have someone lying about something, someone tells a story and they're actually lying about this experience, you can kind of juxtapose what they're actually saying with what actually happened visually and display what they're saying, saying and then display what actually happened um, like in, in actual drawn format. I mean, that would be an interesting way to undermine or actually highlight someone's false testimony or mm. false the story. It's a great form of dramatization, I think, but never had a chance to do it. 
And there's lots of other things that you can do that are like that that I think would be interesting in terms yes. of just storytelling in general. Oh, absolutely. So I hope you get to do that because I, I agree that that's a wonderful option. <laughs> Yeah, but it really? depends on um, what kind of story just drop on my lap. It's like I don't write that much these days, to be honest, fictional mm. stories. So, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> we'll see, to be honest. Right. So with, with Small Shan, you actually initially were to make the whole thing into a comic? Is that? That was, what, I was, that was what was asked of me. And yes. uh, given what the time span I had, it's like there was no way I could do that without cutting 90% of it. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, Kylie seemed open-minded mm. and she liked my suggestions. So I thought we'll give that a try. Mm -hmm. And because um, normally people are very strict about, no, well, I want a graphic novel. That's it. Keep it a graphic novel at the end. You have to cut 90% of it and cut 90% of it. <laughs> you know, but um, Kylie actually had a fair bit amount of clout because of her sales figures. And so she was able to get this and make it happen. Awesome. Yeah, so good for her for that, um, <laughs> for allowing this experiment to, to even happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really an interesting form. Maybe maybe it'll become even more popular and we'll see more of it by different artists as well. I would like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that would be fun, but, but we'll see, you know. <laughs> so uh, to our listeners, that's, you know, go out and, and do something like that. <laughs> um, what about you? Do you have any current creative projects that you're working on? Uh, I mean, you said you're, you're currently doing your PhD, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm um, still doing Women Who Are Kings, um, mm. Catherine the Great, of course, that is a bit on the back burner now because of the PhD. Mm. Uh, my PhD is on the juncture between comics and video games. Oh. So I'm looking at digital comics and uh, that's an interesting thing for me because I've used um, from a programming background originally. And so um, to get back into programming for my PhD, because it is going to be a creative project that uses a, a game engine like Unity to create a comic strip. So I've been getting back into that and started making a game of my own kind of, and uh, that's been interesting. So I'm working on that and hoping to kind of do more experimentations. That's like a mix between comics and uh, video games. You know, um, finding awesome. a direction that digital comics can go in. Because um, right now, a lot of what we understand as digital comics is basically just print comics, but in digital form. So like ebooks. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's been some mild experimentations, but nothing that is particularly interesting. And um, mm -hmm. it's also very limiting given the technology that comic artists sometimes have access to. I mean, the thing about um, comic, uh, creating comics that is so good for most people is that it's so low tech. So here's a pen, here's a paper, where you go. <laughs> But once you get into more complex stuff, like creating a, a gamified version of a comic strip, then you're asking for people with skills that could do things that are different. Mm -hmm. And that, leads a, that requires a level of technical skill that, A, many game developers don't have either. You know? So mm -hmm. um, suddenly the learning curve is no more, no longer, here's a piece of paper, here's a pen. The learning curve suddenly just shoots up. And the amount of time that you need to be able to understand how to make Unity do what you want you know, that actually becomes very hard. The barrier to entry has suddenly gone from, you know, the floor to a three-story building, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the amount of effort that you need. So I'm not even sure whether this sort of thing will catch on, but I think it is worth looking into mm -hmm. just as a way of um, experimenting with storytelling techniques. Yeah, though, I, though I don't think it'll be widespread in time soon, but uh, it is worth, <laughs> you know, having, having a go and even just learning some programming skills that I've pretty much lost over the past um, mm. makes sense uh, that, I think that sounds like an exciting project I agree it's probably not going to catch on very widely I know that I I like drawing comics but if I if you wanted me to make a gamify comic I think well the barrier would be very high as you said mm -hmm. so, I think people yeah. would want to do it I think people are not very very interested mm. both readers and both creators oh but, yeah you know how would you get the skills to create something like that yes. you know you it is not something you can go on a youtube tutorial and have them teach you because youtube tutorials are teaching you how to make mario games you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> not really anything that breaks the mold and that's where the challenge comes from mm -hmm. but i think it is um, definitely worth looking into these kind of games would definitely be categorized more as games than they would be comics but i think um the, the goal of the um, creator matters as well and how, what the, uh, the creator identifies as matters. 
it's like when I talked about Australian um, creations and what makes something an Australian product, you know, uh, um, piece of artwork. And I'm like, well, the creator's Australian, you know, that makes it Australian. Likewise yeah. with comics and games, it's like, well, what makes this a video game as opposed to a comic, a digital comic? And I'm like, well, the creator's a comic artist and identifies as one. Mm. I think that alone is enough to make it a comic as opposed to a video game, even if it uses a game engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, you know, what you come up with in your Gamify comic and hopefully that'll be somehow publicly available. Do you know? Oh, it or... probably would be put online. <laughs> <laughs> I just put it online. It's for my PhD anyway. So All right. Might as well. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, it's just, we just started the PhD anyway. So we'll mm. see. We need to write the thesis portion first. <laughs> Well, good luck with that. I know it can Thank be you. a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing my PhD as well. They're not on really? quite such a, it's <laughs> such a, well, what, transmedia project. It's mm -hmm. probably easier in my case, but uh, yeah, sounds absolutely exciting. Um, that's all I have on questions. Is there anything that you'd like to add to tell us, or I don't know, maybe to ask about a project? <laughs> um not really um, i mean well yeah i mean about your project like can you tell me a little bit more about like what it what it is and what sure goals with it are? well uh it's it's planned as an online teaching uh course that is expanding mm -hmm. and expanding uh so we've already taught australian speculative fiction for two terms and mm -hmm. we now get the chance to make there's a, a two term course. So the first bit will be on reading and discussing uh, different kinds of speculative fiction. And we'll likely present our students with different sessions. So there'll be one on fantasy, one on Gothic, one on sci-fi, but there'll also be one on, on visual narratives, one on short stories. And the aim is to, to cover as broad a field as possible when it comes to speculative, Australian speculative fiction and allow the students to choose a, a set of maybe three or four sessions out of, well, how many we get prepared till the next term and the term after that. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the course will be our students writing a blog posts themselves on a public mm -hmm. blog about Australian speculative fiction. Perhaps they can do podcasts and videos as well as in the, you know, the way we are doing these interviews right now. And uh, so it's a bit of a, a double thing. We, ha we have the teaching part. That's kind of the main bit, making uh, online teaching experience. But we also have a kind of public outreach, I want to say, part, because we have these podcasts and they're online. And the interviews will be online as well, publicly available. And then we have our students write blog posts which are also not going to be internal to the university, but but more widespread and hopefully we'll be able to mm -hmm. make some advertisement on Twitter as well. So yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of that as a mix of, of teaching and making Australian speculative fiction more well known. So <laughs> that's awesome. But why Australian speculative fiction? Is there anything about it that attracted you to begin with? Or? Well, to be honest, uh, there's an Australian there's a Center for Australian Studies that our university has entered a cooperation with. Mm -hmm. And I attended one of the first meetings where our university was present there. And each university has to propose uh, or has to enter an, an online course to their cooperation. And since I was there and I like speculative fiction, <laughs> that was my suggestion. So that's really kind of a little bit of an accident, but mm. a really rewarding one because I've, I keep finding so many fascinating writers and artists that I didn't know were there because of the issues that, that you've described. So mm -hmm. uh, it's been really like exciting. Discovering certain creators are Australian is like, oh, really? It's like, mm. it's Australian. That's yes, yes, absolutely. Like Trudy Canavan, but also Garth Nix. I knew them, mm -hmm. I read them before, but knowing that they were Australian, didn't, didn't know that before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a bit of a, a lucky coincidence, I'd say. <laughs> yeah but that's great sounds like you're really enjoying it yes yes i am and i'm enjoying getting to have these interviews so thank you again mm -hmm. for 
you know, taking the time. Oh, uh, that was fun. <laughs> great. 